Yes. All right, we'll call this special board meeting to order. Bad me back there. Are we recording this somewhere? Uh, let the minute show that we have an established quorum. And we have one action item today, and it's to approve the budget uh, for 2223 school year. Budget, all right. Mr. Williams. <laughs> so it's going to be the Terry Rescavit show today. Um, she has sent you, and I, well, she sent it to me, and I forwarded to you a copy of the budget that we will go over that's specific to our district. She asked me if there was anything that I wanted her to cover uh, in particular today, other than just those numbers, and I asked her to put together something uh, in general on revenues and expenditures for schools in the state of Arkansas. And so some of this may be familiar to some of you, some of you maybe not. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to turn the floor over to Terry. All right. I want to thank you guys for um, having a special session just for the budget. Um, helps just for me. you. I <laughs> know. No. I'm an only child, so this is perfect. Perfect. <laughs> also, hands out, you know, for these two ladies that showed up for a budget meeting. I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> First thing I want to talk about is the budget that I gave you this year looks different than the one that you have seen in previous years because I only compared us to last year. I did not give you the stats for all of those years prior. Um, those were just hard to read and hard to follow. So um, we've had a couple years of pandemic and so the numbers look just nuts. And so um, I did that. And again, this year we have a balanced budget, meaning I have um, allocated all the expenses to match the same amount of revenue that I have projected us to have in this current school year. There are four different types of revenues that a school district receives. We get state money, which could be our foundation funding, our foundation funding, student growth money, we get categorical funds, we get supplemental URT, plus everything else that's in that section on the spread on your budget report. We get local money, mostly property taxes. I mean, that's basically what we get local. Um, our federal money is something that we don't talk about a lot. You hear us talk about it, but those are our title funds. Title I, Title II A, Title VI B, Medicaid, that is given to us from the federal government and it is set aside for specific purposes to increase education for certain populations of the school. Um, last but not least is that whole category called other, which could go under local, but that would be our interest that we receive on our checking accounts. That would be any contribution somebody would want to make. Um, we rent out our facilities and so that money goes there and any money our boosters raise for their clubs is put in an activity fund and that's considered other. I am going to focus on these two today, okay? Some of it will probably overlap a little and that's okay. Um, Question? Yes, sir. Real quick. On the federal monies? Uh -huh. How does that flow to us? It goes through the state. It does. And then comes to us. Yes, sir. Okay. Making sure. State revenue. What is it and how is it calculated? I broke down and pulled out some of the big ones. There are lots of others, but I didn't want to talk about all of them. So I picked out some of the bigger ones. And you may or may not know what that is. Um, our fi foundation funding is what is necessary to supplement local revenue so that each school district gets the same amount of money per child. So when you hear us say, well, foundation funding is 7413. It is, I'll show you later, but we have to figure out how much local money we're going to get and then the state supplements us for the difference. That the state does not give us 7314. I thought that for a long time till I started doing budgets and stuff. I went, oh, okay. Um, teacher salary equalization. I didn't have room to type out equalization. That is funding that was 
state has dedicated to increasing teacher salaries. We will get that from now on. When they raised um, the base pay for a new teacher and realized that we were underneath, any school that was underneath the state average got awarded this money. And that was the only time I was so glad not to be above average. So we got, that was the first year that we were able to give that large, bon uh, not bonus, raise. Yes, sir. Let me clarify, that's not state average. <clears throat> what they did was, this was two years ago, the state figured the average teacher salary across all of the Southern Regional Education Board states, and that's I believe 13 Southeastern states. And so they took the average salary across all 13 of those states. <clears throat> Any school district whose average salary fell below that average, which was actually most of the school districts in Arkansas, got the 180, extra $185 per student to put specifically in teacher salaries, and we did that. Uh, but it was not the state average because it was actually there was probably 80 to 85 percent of the school districts that actually received that money. Okay, sorry, I misspoke. Um, we get supplemental URT, and that simply means um, supplemental rate of tax. It, and the state guarantees us 98 percent of the first 25 mils of uh, property taxes every year. Student growth is additional funding that we receive to handle an increasing number of students. And ABC Preschool is a statewide pre-kindergarten program that serves low-income three- and four-year-old children. Yes, sir. What does the URT Universal say? rate of tax. So that came out of uh, the Lakeview School District. Uh, the Lakeview School District case in 2002, three somewhere in that neighborhood, where the state was found to be, uh, uh, they were not adequately funding education, according to the courts. So part of the solution for that to, to make everything more uniform across the state, the state said that every school district had to have at least 25 mils taxation on their public, on their local community, their district, and so that raised some of the school district's um, tax because some of them weren't at 25 mils. So everybody had to have 25 mils. You could have more than that based on your local voters. But that 25 mils was guaranteed. And if you had 25 mils, then that equaled what the foundation funding from the state was going to be, which is now $7,300. So that 25 mils guarantees every district $7,300 and some change for every student in the district, even if their local taxes doesn't raise that much, which very few school districts actually raise that much locally, so the state has to supplement that. The 98% URT, when they figured, after that, they figured out that some school districts collect a whole lot more taxes percentage-wise than other school districts. And so they guaranteed that with that 25 mils, every school district would get at least 98% of the amount that that 25 mils represents for each of their students. And so at the end of the year, if our collections don't equal 98%, they're gonna give us additional money. If we get 100% of our taxes, we're gonna pay the state back money. Did I say any of that Good wrong? Good job, <laughs> Jody's paid attention to that in these meetings. So just to give you an idea of how foundation funding from the state is actually calculated and how they decide how much money they're gonna give us, they look at our current assessment and find the value of one mil. Our current value is 435,833. Well, they guarantee 98% of the first 25 mils so that's 10,677,909. They go by the prior three quarter average daily attendance. That's what an ADM, average daily membership. So how many kids on average were in school every day? And they do this by quarter. And our three quarter average last year, for last year was 427,709. So to calculate how much revenue we're going to receive per student, you take the 98% of the first 25 mils and divide it by that three quarter average. So the state says, well, of the 7413, <clears throat> Siloam can pay for $2,496.54. So this 
4916 is what we have to supplement to them. And that's multiplied by the three quarter average to come up with this. You will notice this doesn't necessarily match what I have on the budget. Um, I think I looked at the assessment. I think the assessment I looked at is different than the one that the state was looking at, but it's not off, but like $4,000 or something. But that's how they decide how much money we're going to get. So when you see foundation funding, they have gone through this huge calculation to figure that out. She's going to share this presentation <clears throat> with you guys. So don't feel like you have to write down a whole lot of stuff. But she will share this with you. Teacher equalization, as Jody told us earlier, it's $185 per student or per three quarter average ADM. So next year we're going to receive $791,000. Seven hundred seven ninety one two sixty two. I'll get it down in a minute. Supplemental URT is that ninety eight percent of the first twenty five meals that we are guaranteed, and so we're going to get ten million six seventy seven nine oh nine. All I'm taking all the mystery out of this. You guys will never <laughs> think it's hard ever again. Now that I'm doing it, <clears throat> student growth. <laughs> 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 student growth is an interesting calculation it's based on this year's numbers but last year's numbers and even a number from the year before so what they do is every quarter they figure out what our average daily membership is for each quarter that quarter is compared to prior year quarters and if your ADM is up you get more money. Your ADM is down, you get declining balance. And remember last year we started out with a declining balance because they projected us <clears throat> to have lower um, membership and then our, we went up, we got more kids. This year, just looking at our numbers, and we're about to find out what our real number is in a few days, um, I sat down with Mr. Wiggins and, and we are comfortable with thinking that our ADM this year is going to be $4,400 or 4,400 students. And so, again, there's no mystery. You take a fourth of the foundation funding, multiply it by each quarter's increase in ADM to come up with each quarter, how much you think you're going to get each quarter. So my projection is 940.005. So we start the year, they fund us based on last year's three quarter ADM, which is that 4277.12 in the middle. That's how much we averaged if you averaged first, second, third quarter last year. Excellent. So our funding is based on that at the beginning of the year, but when you, if you grow, then you get a little bit extra. Well, you end up getting over the course of four quarters, you get 7,400 and whatever dollars for every student that you're over that, but it comes quarterly. So they do the growth funds quarterly? We do not receive them quarterly. They, they calculate them quarterly. Okay. We receive them twice a year. That's what I was saying. But they calculate them. They do calculate quarter. it. It's based on every quarter. Yes. Okay. Do our quarters, I mean, do they change much? Our quarter averages? Um, so historically speaking, we've gone down throughout the year uh, from what we were at the beginning of the year. So our first quarter to second quarter, we may lose 10 or 15 <clears throat> students, and we may lose that many again to the third quarter and again to the fourth. But the last several years, we've actually, there have been a couple of years that we've actually grown during the year, which is was highly unusual before that. So it's kind of difficult to predict right now. We, we, have, a lot of, we have a lot of kids that come and go, though. Yeah. So we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of, I don't know what the right word for that. We have a lot that come in and go out in the same year. Uh, we have a lot of students that move a lot. Highly mobile. Highly mobile. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> Thank you. And remember, this is not based on enrollment. It's how much they're actually at school. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that, yeah. that COVID had that effect. They locked in the number. They didn't hurt for first year. They didn't do anything about it. They just kind of said, oh, we're going to give you forgiveness because they shut the schools down. There wasn't a fourth quarter <clears throat> number to compare to. So um, 
and everybody was going down. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody was going down. ABC Preschool, ABC stands for Arkansas Better Chance. Um, it's given to you, they give us $5,070 per student. We have 160 seats, so they're going to give us $811,200, uh, plus an extra $10,000 to start up a new classroom because they gave us 20 more seats this year. So that's the amount that we're going to receive for ABC this year. Like I said, I'm taking all the mystery out of these calculations. That's so, okay. Let me talk about pre-K really quick. So when we first started pre-K, there was some hesitation from the board. That's been a long time. Uh, because the state actually doesn't, with the money we receive as a public school, they don't fund pre-K. Uh, what is required of the state is to fund public education K-12. And so that does not include pre-K. The ABC program came up about the same time we were starting. Uh, the pre-k program and it is additional money it's actually kind of like grant money um, because all, all schools don't get it you have to apply for it and you have to be awarded slots for it so we had had i don't know if we i think we started with 100 slots and we have gradually increased that to 160 now is that correct mm -hmm. okay so we just got we had been asking for the 20 additional spots for about six or seven years uh, we actually added four classrooms at Northside thinking we were going to get them um, and so we were just awarded those this year that's through the Department of Health ABC yes is not run through the education right. department it's through the Department of Health but that amount of money actually allows us <laughs> to pay for uh, all the salary involved for uh, <clears throat> teachers and aides because every classroom has to have a teacher and aide in pre-k by Department of Health rules uh, so that that money basically covers that, and then what the district is out for pre-K is just the the space and the utilities, basically. And is it low income or? I mean, yes. No. And I may not say this exactly right, but to qualify, someone has to be two hundred percent below federal poverty level. Is that correct? And I don't know how that's figured, but that's the number that I've been told. So did we fill those 20 spots or we yes. hoping yes. We, yes we have waiting list we oh, had a yes. waiting list We've never had a problem not, filling not three right. huh. yeah. now we do take uh, three-year-olds uh, you could be only four-year-olds but we have opened it up which is which is fine we open it up for three and four-year-olds we take four-year-olds first and then three-year-olds and then if there's any spots left uh, we open it up to a, a limited number of paid spots but the only paid spots we have right now we try to reserve, we reserve four or five for teachers, mm -hmm. just in case uh, that we have a teacher that needs that to, mm -hmm. to help them out. Uh, but this year we only have one. We only have one. Okay. And uh, how, what size are the classrooms? You've got 160 seats. And did we 20 have, each. 20 each. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and the classroom started, did you say one or two this year? This year, one. One, okay. Any other questions? And, Sorry, the no. ten the ten thousand classroom startup. The the other like the salaries and things are paid out of the other yes. figure, yes. right? Yes. So we the ten thousand is get this the extra ten next year. The amount right. I will budget for next year will be eight eleven two hundred. Gotcha. So the, the thinking with the classroom startup is materials, supplies, right. desks, okay. uh, right. rugs, That's all the things. And that also, goes they have specific things they tell you you have to have in gotcha. the classroom. So you have mats. Yeah. Yeah. Buy buy them. They have they actually have these little mats or cots that they have to take nap, naps yeah. on and different things. Local revenue, basically property taxes. Property taxes are made up of three different components. You have your <coughs> real property, which is your house and your land. You have personal property, which are cars, mobile homes, livestock. I wrote something down about that because I thought it was hilarious. That it was something I never thought about being personal. Vehicles, motorcycles, boats, farm equipment, mobile homes, trailers, and livestock. And that value is based on book value, not assessed value. And then the utility. We get utility taxes too, and that's like the um, cell tower poles nuclear power plants that we don't have one um, but yeah telephone poles cell phone towers and that value is assessed by the Public Service Commission 
so we don't have anything to do with that. Did you purposely choose those shapes for the puzzle to not fit with any <laughs> other? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We've been right. down this road before. And, and yes, he, yes, I did. He may have a comment about your font later. <laughs> no, no. Font's good. About a year ago, I remember the same conversation. <laughs> So, real quick, I was asked this weekend, and I'm trying to think who asked me this, but somebody asked me this weekend if, oh, it, it, I went to visit my dad, and I saw somebody there, and we were talking about property taxes, because Highland School District, where I'm from, has proposed a, a millage increase. And there was somebody there that asked me about, uh, couldn't they just raise income, I mean, uh, sales tax, local sales tax, instead of property tax and the answer to that question is no you notice income tax and sales tax is not part of that equation up there so the only those are the only taxes property those are the only kind of, well there's is there other taxes that you're going to cover or is it just that it's just that it's just that so income tax and sales tax cannot be figured into a local school district's budget you cannot we do not have the authority to ask for those things to be bumped up to support the local school. Um, property tax, real the real property tax, house and land, is by far the biggest category of income for the local school district. Which is not true for the other states. No. Some of our surrounding states can use hmm. sales tax to fund school. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. So real property taxes, it's the amount we receive from our local real property taxes and is based upon assessed property value multiplied by our millage rate. And our millage rate this year is 44.9 mills because we had the rollback. It's different than appraised value. So you guys are going to say, why? I had an appraisal. Well, you don't want to pay taxes off your appraisal. You want to pay it off of your assessed value. Because they take your appraised value, the city, county, and multiplies it by 20%, and that's what your assessed value is. So our portion, and I shouldn't have titled that real taxes. I should have just said local taxes. Um, there's our current assessment again, and our current millage is 44.9. So for the tax year 2021, our portion of the local property taxes looked like this. So if we would have gotten every single dollar that was due to us, we would have gotten $19.5 million. Doesn't work like that. Um, tax years are assessed from January until December. You can't start paying them until March of the next year. Most people don't pay them if they're not rolled into their mortgage until October 15th, which is in another school year. So we start receiving last year's taxes in two different school years every year. And so it's hard to track. You just have to trend it. I've been trending it ever since I've been working here. And um, it looks very different once you start watching the trends and you realize the hills and valleys that you're going to have with receiving income for whatever reason. I mean, it's obvious why we get big bumps in September and October because that's when everybody's paying. But for some reason in April and May, I don't know if everybody wakes up and goes, oh, I can assess and pay my time. I don't know, but we get another big, couple of big deposits in the spring. So our millage used to be 45. And if you remember back in the, uh, it was probably last winter, I talked to you about having to roll back. <clears throat> we had to roll back because our total assessment went up more than 10% from one year to the next. And that's because we had a reassessment in Benton County. So Benton County went countywide, reassessed everything. Our assessment jumped up a little bit more than 10%. And if you jump up more than 10% by state law, you have to roll back so that you're only going up 10%. So we took off 0.1 mils so that we would match that. So you, you've heard me say, 
well, you're guaranteed 98%. Why don't you just, it's not hard, why don't you just book 98% of the taxes that we're going to get? We, well, there's lots of reasons. The tax year, the way I just spoke to you about the tax collection year, is very different than a school district year. It crosses over two different years. 98% um, is only guaranteed for the first 25 mills. So the next 19.9 mills aren't guaranteed at all. And um, so you have to watch how much you actually receive and that percentage goes um, every which way. Um, we have $8.9 million due to us that is not guaranteed out of all of that money from the taxes. Um, I have been trending it in, on average, in any school year, we receive anywhere from 76 to 78% of what is owed in that year. So that's how I calculate taxes. Because I get the, I got a calculation later. Now, um, now we end up we end up getting about ninety eight percent total, but in that year you're talking about in, in that calendar year. But school years, I have to right. budget over two years for right. that income. Right. So, but yes, I get we get seventy we get all of the ninety eight percent, but of whatever's remaining, typically we've only gotten seventy seven percent because some of that's from last year and some of it's from the year before, and so. Um, and in our taxes, we have to break them out for whatever reason for the state. They want to know how much did this, how much did that. So you'll see on your board report, I always have property taxes fall. That's simply all of the property tax we received from July to December. Then you see property taxes spring. That's what we received from January until June. That's, that's all it is. And the state has us break that out. I don't know why. We also have delinquent taxes, and so that those are taxes that come in that are at least a year old. There is no guarantee how much delinquent tax you're going to get in any given year. I usually average it. Um, excess conditions, of course, everybody has a holdback. Um, it's in excess of the treasurer's salary for the cost of operating the treasurer's office. Um, a portion of the proceeds from property taxes is withheld by the treasurer prior to distribution for normal expenses to operate the assessor's office, the collector's office, and the treasurer's office. And at the end of the year, you'll see me, I only post this one time a year. Sometime they'll say, this is how much is left over and here's what you get. So that's a wild card too, every year. So. Again, I look back about three years and average it and go, okay, that's that's probably what we're going to get. Um, land redemption is when they actually go to the courthouse steps and sell off property. It takes five to seven years from the time they don't pay taxes until this sale happens. And so that's a long time to wait. But um, again, it's another one that there is no magic formula for predicting it. But, you know, it's okay. And then, you know, of course, we have interest, rental of buildings, refunds. And when I say refunds, it's if maybe we had a credit at a business from the prior year, and they, we call them and say, hey, we'd like to have that in a check. They'll send us a check for that. Um, Sprint Broadband, Jody, or back in the day, Mr. Wiggins made a deal with Sprint and they rent, help me Jody. we lease to them our our broadband. Yes. Our additional broadband. That's the easy way to put it. Okay. Yeah, I knew I'd mess that up. So they actually pay us rent every month on that. Moving on to broad categories of expenses. How did I budget for expenses this year? My first priorities are salaries and benefits. <laughs> That took up 74%. Um, we had debt payment, we had bond payment, it takes up 7%, and utilities cost us 3%. So the remaining 16%, it's budgeted in many ways, and this is not an exclusive list. 
this is just what what it buys. It buys all our technology and software. It does our building <clears throat> repairs. It buys general supplies for our teachers, staff. It includes toilet paper, cleaning supplies. That's what falls under general supplies. We have outside custodial services that it pays for. Insurance on all of our buses and all of our buildings. Furniture and fixtures as we need to replace those. <clears throat> it buys buses and pays for fuel. We buy textbooks. If we're going to do a bonus, it comes out of this extra 16%. It also pays for all of our copy machines, our copies, um, and postage. But again, this is not an exhaustive list. I mean, there's so much more that goes into it, but those were the biggest categories I wanted to mention. Now, if y'all will open up your board report, we'll go over some variances that stick out. So on the front page, it's just comparing last year's actual to this year's budget. And you can see just by looking that um, our big bump is coming basically from our state revenues. Not our local revenues, but from our state revenues. Um, uh, if you turn the page to unrestricted revenue, the second page, the first one that's got the blue line on it. Um, I have projected an increase in property taxes, as Jody mentioned earlier, we got reassessed and um, it was fantastic and so this is what the project, all those figures came out to be <laughs> was this. Um, I simply budgeted the same for delinquent excess commissions, did that the same. Everything else is pretty, pretty straightforward and standard. Do you have any questions about the local revenue? Moving on to the state revenue, you will see that we got a million dollar raise from the state for our foundation funding. That has to deal, they gave, um, they raised the right to 7413 this year, which includes money for the additional costs of insurance that the school district's having to pick up for half of the year this year. Um, student growth is my projection. Teacher insurance, employee insurance. We used to have to pay 150 around $150 for every employee. We pay $173.63 per. We pay $173.63 towards employee insurance premiums every month. Per month. But that has been increased. The going state forward, has now said everybody's going to contribute $300 per employee per month for part of their insurance. But they increased our state funding to theoretically balance that out, but it didn't actually balance it, it out. It didn't balance it out. Um, so yeah, that's a little, it's a sore spot, but I'll get over it. Um, student growth, I showed you all how I calculated student growth to see that increase. Um, as you go down, SPED catastrophic is, I think we still have some really fragile children and I'm positive, I've got a positive, not that I want to have this, you know, disadvantaged children, but it's, you know, it, that population is growing. It is not receding at all. So I think we're going to maintain that level of catastrophic income. ABC Preschool, I told you about, we got 20 more seats, so they gave us some more money. Um, the Smart Start Math, and Amy Carter laughs at this because it's called the MC1 one something something grant, but the state told me to call it Smart Start. Um, those, we had two separate grants, and one was for 2021, 21 22. The second one started in 21 22 and ends this year. So we've only got the last half of the second grant left to come to us. Do y'all have any questions about that? Okay, moving on to teacher salaries. Please remember that this is only salary for certified staff. So like my salary is not included in this. Our custodian salaries are not included in this. There are no benefits in this. This is straight 
salary, and that's all. Um, part of some of the large increases that you see is we did give a raise this year. Um, there's probably a bonus calculated in there. And so you will see some jumps that you can't, you're like, well, how could that be? Um, when you look at our athletic, you'll see that it actually went down. Athletics typically stays about the same. We had a very large shuffle of job duties and coaches this year, and that's how it shook out. A lot of the negatives that you see are that we replaced some folks that had been here for a long time with people with lesser experience. Um, there's just a myriad of reasons why these change, but if you have any one in particular you would like to ask about, I can certainly address that. So I'll hit on one. Okay. Just as an, just as a, for instance, mm -hmm. English is a second language. You'll see that that went down one hundred and two thousand dollars in salaries from last year to this year. Um, that's because I moved some of those salaries out of district paid salaries to federal paid or state categorical. So we get certain buckets of money that can only be spent for certain things. And so for ESL, we have two of those piles of money. We get one from the federal government that's called Title III, and we get one from the state that's called state ELL money. And those are standalone accounts that can only be spent for ESL or ELL teachers. And so we had paid a couple of salaries out of this fund, out of district money, that I moved into either Title III or ELL. So it doesn't show up in the district budget now. Another big swing that you will see is you will see a large negative in special education, but if mm -hmm. you come down to special education director, we reclassified some people and changed how what bucket they were getting paid from, and it made more sense. Um, Ms. Shauna and I worked together to make better sense out of who gets charged to what function, and it's probably the best alignment we've had for your department in a long time. Um, have a tendency to change teachers and staff a lot, so I don't always get the coding probably where it should be, but Shauna and I wiped the slate clean this year and started all over and said, here's how we're going to do it going forward. We kind of always did it how it always been done and it didn't necessarily make sense to us, but it makes sense to us now. <laughs> we know exactly where everybody's getting paid from. I was going to ask that one, so thank you. I wondered if the two correlated. Yes. And then the principal's office, that seems like a giant leap, but um, we've added, we had to pick up half of Ms. Schlake's salary. It was being paid out of ESSER, but now that she's part-time over our ALE, the district has to pay that portion of her salary. We also um, changed Mr. Shoemaker's um position within our district so that was an added basically an added position in our um, principal office but it's also part of the reason why our athletic salaries are down is because we're no longer paying him as a coach any others okay moving on to um, operating fund expenditures this is everything other than teacher salary. So this is my salary. This is the custodian salary. This is everybody's benefits. This is um, general supplies and all of that other stuff. This, that's what rolls here. Um, big changes again. You will see that um, high school went down a tremendous amount of money. Number one, they had a grant for all of this special curriculum that Amy can talk more in depth about than I can. Um, but we also got a grant for replacing computers. That was the building that most of those computers went to. So in order to keep up with, I mean, we still have technology 
um, budgeted for the high school, but it's a lot less than what it would have been because we got to replace um, Chromebooks last year. Um, the separate day school is a district. We have to pick up portions of our children that have to go to outside places um, for special counseling and things like that. Last year was the first year we've ever had to do that, and we really didn't know what it was going to cost, so this year it's just more reflective of what we think the cost will be this year, if all things remain the same. You'll see alternative learning. That is our K through eight ALE that is housed in this building. We've never had that before. So you will also see that on teacher salaries, and you will see it on this side. Um, that pays for their salaries. The money that Jody was talking about, the alternative learning environment money, um, it's going towards our eight, uh, 9 through 12 ALE. What did Randall do to get such a problem? Well, Randall, we've got some big <laughs> projects coming up. We're having some issues with um, some of our chillers at the high school, and those are very expensive. Um, we also plan, I don't know if you've noticed, the new flooring that's going in, or that is in over here. We are wanting to do that throughout this building and some other places, so um, that's where a lot of that, because I asked the same thing. I was like, oh my gosh, what is this about? So, so on the flooring, our thought process, because it is, it's kind of expensive, but when you balance what we pay every summer, so we paid somewhere, this is a really a rough estimate, so don't hold me to the exact numbers, but somewhere around $250,000 is what it costs us to wax forward every summer by the time we buy the material and then pay the people to do it and then pay an outside vendor to help us get it done for time-wise. We're trying to eliminate that. The new flooring, we would have to do away with that. So even though we're going to have some double cost, we hope over time that that waxing will never be zero because we have some floors with beautiful floors we don't want to cover, but we're trying to get it down to where we don't need an outside vendor and our costs are down below $100,000 a summer to do that. And it's going to take us a little time, but that is, that's the plan and that's why we, that's our thought process is over time we will eventually save money. It'll pay for itself. Do utilities come out of maintenance as well? Yes. So electric and gas we are anticipating are going to be a little bit higher this year as well okay you turn the page and go to debt service there there's no surprise there i know what we're going to pay for our bonds for the next 30 years so um, it'll go up a little bit every year there should not be any large jumps but um, that comes straight off of the depreciate or allocation schedule so there's really no surprises there so that's basically our mortgage <laughs> yeah basically it is um as you go forward the next four pages are what we call our categorical funds and those are funds that come to us from the state for specific programs and so we have alternative learning environment or learning fund um it, again, basically pays for all the stuff that we need over at our 9, or nine through 12 ALE on Main Street. Um, English language learners is exactly what it sounds like it is. And we get, it's based on a formula and I actually have it broken out. If somebody really wants to look at it after the meeting, I can talk to you about that. Um, the, the state calculates it based on three-quarter average, imagine that. I mean, a lot of these things are based on last year's numbers. Enhanced Student Achievement used to be called National School Lunch Act. It, the amount of funding we get for this is based on the percentage of free and reduced children that we serve in our cafeterias. This one's actually state. What? We get two different sources that are kind of based on that. <coughs> this is state uh, ESA, and it's based strictly on free and reduced. Mm -hmm. And then Title I from federal is also kind of based on free and reduced, but not really. It's actually based on poverty in your school district, and that comes from 
some other source other than than the school district. So. That's why this this fund is one of the reasons you've probably seen a massive amount of stuff pushing parents to fill out this. Our, the previous one is, if I'm not mistaken, Terry, based on the work we fit in the schedule, we get $583 per student that qualifies in our district. If we ever were at 70%, that would double. Yeah, it's a lot of money. And then if you get 90 to 95, I can't remember, it triples. Because, but we, you know, obviously won't be there and we're not close to 70 but it's one of the reasons so i've had some people complain a little bit about they've had a lot of contact and they're like don't contact me anymore and we're, we're just trying to make sure we do the best thing we can for kids because after eating free for two years people forget how important it is to fill out this form mm -hmm. even and that number will be determined <coughs> friday afternoon at four o'clock when we get the last thing put in the system that's what that number will be figured on, and that it doesn't matter if we if we get another thousand kids sign up in November. That our they don't get counted. Mm -hmm. Right now, kids can still eat free if they qualify later on, but this part, this funding stuff will not. It doesn't change. So we need to lower wages. <laughs> well, and, and that's an interesting question uh, because yeah. there are a lot of districts that are saying that their number of free and reduced lunch students this year are actually down quite a bit from pre-pandemic. And the thinking behind that as why is salaries have gone up and the federal requirement, the federal level for qualifying for this has not. So a lot of our families who work hourly jobs, a lot of our parents who work hourly jobs that used to qualify for free and reduced, if they've gotten a bump in pay, now they may not qualify. Because that, for a family of three kids, family of five, I think that number, do you know that? I think it's like $29,000. Uh, family of five, actually, it's, a little, it's actually higher. Than, it's, okay. like, it's like thirty-seven or $38,000, I think. Uh, so, but it's still not if they've gotten if they were barely qualifying and they, say they got a two dollar an hour raise that probably kicks them out will kick them out of it not more because we were having some people who've always qualified in the past for some level are not qualifying they're look they're pretty frustrated by it actually we don't you know we don't get to make a decision we put the information in the system and it says you're approved or you're not so at all but it is it has definitely been a uh, a challenge so far, to say the least. Well, that's always been my soapbox: is just raising the minimum wage doesn't change the poverty level. Right. But if they don't raise it with you, right, mm -hmm. then the standards for the lunches, mm -hmm. right, they're going to get this all the time. And I do want to make this clear: is so we talking about free and reduced lunch. We had an opportunity, the state asked us, do you want to count kids to be able to use a form just from this last school year that they filled out? Because we asked people to fill it out even though everybody got to be free. Very few people did. The year before, we didn't say we could do that. Or we could count them all the way back to 19 if they had a form filled out any of those three years and qualified, they could eat for the first 30 days of school. So every year when you start school, their status stays the same as the end of the year before. So if they would come over this year for 30 days, that allows people to get forms in so they can stay qualified and there's no interruption in pay for, for meals. So we went back to all the way 19, so as many families that could had qualified from 19 till now, they could continue to eat for 30 days. Well, that 30 days also ends Friday. So on Monday, if they haven't qualified for a new, under a new form, they will get moved to a paid status. So I'm expecting to hear from parents who are like, yeah, why is my kid sure. having to pay? Yeah. And I'm like, well, you either didn't qualify with your form or you didn't turn the form in. Get your form turned in. If you qualify, we'll start you back up. It doesn't help us with the funding, but we will be, we will feed kids. And so it's 
it's been a constant communication thing with parents trying to make them understand the importance. And it's not just about eating. I know Terry's broken down all these categories, but we pay for a lot of stuff with ESA money that doesn't have to come out of our budget, which allows us to have more money to give uh, money for teachers. So this is a huge part of that. So that's why we're really pushing hard. What is our annual food budget? <clears throat> We do not report that here. I can, I can, I don't have it with me right now, but they are pretty much a self-sufficient fund. So everything, they pay their own salaries, they pay for all the food. It, none of that comes out of our state and local. It actually comes from, I mean, the state does supplement and reimburse us for free and reduced lunches. And It's actually federal money though. So oh, okay. none of our federal money's in here. So federal, Title I, Title II, Title Three, Title IV. The board does not approve those um, those budgets. The budget that we are required to approve as a board and send in is just our state and local money. And so, like food services, stand alone, <clears throat> they get money in, they spend money, but it's all self-contained. But this all goes to food service now. No, mm -hmm. the ESA money. None of it's all based on. Free it's based lunches, on free and reduced. But it, does, it doesn't go back into food service at all. That's just the form. That's just what they determine. How much we're going to get is based on your free and reduced lunch numbers. That's why and, they changed the name of it a couple of years ago because it was so confusing. Right. It's called National School Lunch Act. Mm -hmm. so if but you, look, you can't spend it on food service. <laughs> it goes so somewhere. if you look on that ESA page, what we are spending a lot of money on is resource officers. Um, that's our safety that everybody's if you look down about. at resource officer we're increasing that considerably because we're anticipating <clears throat> maybe adding um, and then uh, another big expense is health services we pay for a lot of our nurses out of it and then all of those other categories it's just it's a very we're uh, also out of that fund paying for our catapult which is the alarm you can help describe that better than I can yeah it's our it's our EMS software that we're, we've gone through this year that Helps us, uh, that helps us organize during a, and communicate with both parents and teachers during a, uh, an emergency situation. So that's another so bit of safety that's being spent. I've also added lines of safety and budgeted money for it. It is not broken out because the way you have to budget it, it falls into the maintenance category. So how confident are you all that they will continue to pass these just like you know, Esser they rescinded. So this, they're, they're we can probably talk better than I can. We have had worries in the past about uh -huh. ESA funding. Uh, currently, we believe that it's pretty on pretty solid ground. Uh, but there's been threats in the past from the legislator to pull that money back. If they ever did that, all of, We'd be well, most of these things would have to either go away or we would have to find major cuts someplace. But right now, I think it's on pretty stable ground, and be mainly because most schools are paying for security out of it, and most schools are paying for uh, wellness, like nurses. And so that's two big big items that are important yeah. to our yeah. legislators yeah. right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. So I think this fund has become more important to them. And we heard at that training last week that we should have a line item for safety and security. So having a line item in this budget it means a little bit something different. So we're spending safety and security under that resource officer category. We're spending or we're budgeting 303000 this year. And that is safety and security. Mm -hmm. But it's not something that we're going to break out in our overall budget as a safety and security line item because it's coming specifically out of here. We're actually pulling from a couple of different funds to actually pay for some of our safety and security stuff, if that makes sense. It's yeah. there. It's just in different places. So technology. All of our cameras come through technology, so our half of our door, electronic door accesses that we put in, and these come out of tech. The other half comes out of maintenance because there's door hardware that we have to classify. It actually has to go under maintenance. So between maintenance and technology, and then we also and then ESA and then money ESA, and then there's also a small bit of safety stuff in transportation when you start talking about the stuff that goes on a bus. Helping. So it's really spread out all over. We actually talked about trying to figure out how to make it mm -hmm. one time. its own budget. But as she found out, as you start coding the functions, they all go back to 
technology or they all go back to maintenance. Uh, so we decided not to do that. That's yeah. Not I do have one down. small line broken out, but like I said, it's all squished into maintenance, so you can't really see it. Um, go ahead. Sorry. Question, mm -hmm. clarification, comment. <laughs> Because the bulk of my questions come from this section. I would assume that there would be a decent amount of student population that has not turned in the free or reduced lunches. I would assume we would really no, have no way of knowing that. We're, uh, we, we do. Know, but it's, it's, it's a real interesting thing. And I have, in my previous life as a building administrator, been called on the carpet. There's some very stringent rules about who can know what about those forms. Mm -hmm. So in our child nutrition office, they know who our students are and they know who's done a form. Mm -hmm. But law says I can't con we can't contact those people who have not done forms directly. We have to do it through mass. So just because we know that information in that office, like I don't know, and our building principal won't know, but we still have to do it mass because I got in trouble because I was handed a list. These kids hadn't turned in any forms, called their parents and told them to turn in forms. This has been several years ago, and I got a call from the State Department, <laughs> cease and desist, you are violating law, federal law. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the reason we give broad messages and right. barred <clears throat> because legally we can't target people. Sure, sure. And, and, and going back to what you said about <laughs> Monday probably getting overwhelming email. I, I was thinking it as you were saying it. But still yet this ESA fund is tied to that. Yes. Okay. So and some and this ESA money also is tied to our safety, our resource officer. So for clarification purposes, those people that could have free and reduced lunches and have just expected over the last two years because they haven't had to being able to can to continue that is not the case. They must fill that out. Yes. Yes. Which also benefits the school. Yes. Yes. But, but if they fill it out, it's good. after after Friday. Yeah. They wait till Monday to fill it out. Mm -hmm. It will definitely still benefit them because once they turn it in, if they get it the last day of school, we're going to process it and turn them on as a free. They qualify for free immediately at that <clears> Right. But it won't help the school district anymore for funding, our funding purposes. Will be set on Friday afternoon at four, when we put the last four, or actually it's October 1st is mm -hmm. the date, but that's Saturday. So we will stay that late as we have to that mm -hmm. night to process every form we can and get yeah. in the system. Yeah. So our numbers will be as high as possible. Right. So they can always get a form and turn it sure. in later and sure. still eat for free, but it's just not going to help us after Friday. Uh, and it won't help us until next year. Next if year, they yeah. fill out. A and it will start all over again next year. Yeah. and it'll start all over. <laughs> it's a recurring process yeah. every year. I mean, it's always yeah. been a problem yeah. to get people to turn in the forms, but <clears throat> since the last two years, right. everybody right. ate for free. Everybody right. kind of got out of the habit right. of doing it. And right. we've so. tried to put that message out right. with, with how it affects us. Uh, mm -hmm. We've tried to get that message out. It's just hard to get all of that into a a robocall where mm -hmm. that somebody will actually <laughs> listen to. Right. Um, right. So we've tried to get it on our websites and so Facebook. You'll probably, you'll probably get a robocall today. Sure. Okay, because I wrote one up to send out. And one of the things that also qualifies for is if they qualify for free and reduced lunch, we try to put all the other individual benefits that could go along with that. So they could get free free ACT tests when they're once they're old enough to take that test. They could get uh, possible free AP exam fees or any fees that come with that kind of stuff. There's several things they can also qualify for uh, a reduced rate of uh, internet service through various carriers. We don't get to make that decision, but it is all things that, that they will they can qualify for if they will fill the form out to see, yeah. as well as all the things that it helps us do. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. So and I, I would like to clarify. On food stamps, they would automatically get on. Okay, so there, there are yep. certified. That is another, it's kind of its own category that started in the last few years. So if they qualify for SNAP assistance, we get an email from the Department of Health saying this person, and they call them direct certified, which means yep. they qualify for them and we upload them right into the system. So, but we don't, like some people say, well, I know I'm that, so I'll just depend on it. 
Well, anytime you depend upon, no offense to them, but another government entity mm -hmm. to get information over in a timely manner, mm -hmm. it may not work out for you as yeah. well. So that's why we ask people to do both. But we do get direct certified emails on a regular basis, and we upload those as soon as possible. I want to clarify before we move on that Shane was not working in our district when he got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. That's how he came to us. <laughs> and so, what, so parents, these messages they're getting, the form that they fill out, what's on, what, what is this called? What are they hearing it as? Uh, a free and reduced lunch uh, application, free and reduced meal application, and uh, have, uh, ask for very basic information that they have to have their social security number and the reason they do that is when we put it in the software that we don't control we just type the information in and then we put what they tell us their income is it sends through the system runs it through irs to check and see if they're double getting, counting kids they're, yeah or they're saying they make a lot less than their taxes show they made so that's, but it's real basic information. So last year we sent out letters to everyone, I think, because of it, and I got a few calls from people, but it was just because everyone got the letter and they're like, why am I getting this? And it's because everyone got free and reduced. I think we were asking everyone. To well, we were asking because we were worried at the time they weren't going to fund this. They weren't going to hold harmless yeah. this fund. Yeah. So we were worried. If nobody fills the form out this year because we're all everybody's eating free, mm -hmm. then our ESA dollars would go to this much. Yep. And so for this school year, we just started. So we were trying to push everybody to do it. Well, as we they came along, the uh, legislature did finally pass a hold harmless, and we're actually getting funded this year off of 19 numbers, I believe. So ideally, everyone in the district would fill one out and just let them sort it out. Right? In a perfect world, yes. <laughs> so, have, so then, then yeah. we would know because I have all I, since I've gotten here, I've said I truly believe that our I don't think we're at seventy percent by any stretch, but I think our average has been between fifty three and fifty seven percent for and reduced lunch, and I really think we're probably over sixty. I really think there's probably anywhere from seven to ten percent of kids that are families who are not filling the form out for one reason or another. And we have hired interpreters to come in to help like non-English speaking parents to fill these forms out um, because I just sometimes I just don't understand why why they're they filling this out. Have. Huh? One of them gave me a stack of stuff and I signed it all. I don't know what it was. <laughs> you would have had to fill out income information. That's where usually they sign. I never yeah. do that, so yep. never mind. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, so if we, with with the other benefits that families could get from this, you mentioned testing, whatever. Have we thought about changing our marketing, <laughs> kind of changing the name of it and trying to? We can't change the name of the you form. Can't, so it has to be called it's a federal yes. form. It's a, oh, it's a federal form, and they call it the lunch. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just yes. <laughs> I like the way you're thinking. Yeah, no, no I we mean. Can't. Doesn't fit into the puzzle, though. And we, we have tried to market it through Facebook and social media that yeah. there's other benefits. Right. So, and Bambi's done a really good job, and she will do it all week. Yeah. Put, make a last desperate push to try to get stuff in. Yeah. So, he's probably waiting on an animated panther to put with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that may be what we need. Okay. Um, For the last two or three minutes, I'm going to hit another topic. Hang that, on just a second. Uh -huh. Let's go back to that just a minute. When it's all said and done, do we, will we know the percentage of people yes. that filled them out? Well, we, we'll yes. know the percentage that qualified. Do we know the percentage of people filled them I, out? I can, tell, I can tell how many, how many, I will have a number of who, how many people. How many out. forms were returned? Is how it electronic or is it? It can be, it, it can, can be. be, it's both. Electronic Could you paper. share that with us at the next board meeting or the however yes. many board meetings it takes? I think that we all need to work on that for the awareness of parents to understand what's going on, how it affects all students, not just not just the uh, the ones that qualify. I, you know, I think there's a disconnect, even you know, with Facebook or whatever. And then 
whether we get phone calls or emails or we can help push that along and then if we I'd say we hit that every once in a while in board meetings just to keep it going. Okay. I'll get a total number of applications. Just whenever I'm not you know, it doesn't have to be next month, just sometime. I, but I think it'd be good to hear that number. Yes, sir. Thank you. Moving now, on to the building fund and the last two or three minutes, so maybe Travis can you're, you're not five, be too late for his meeting. Yeah, you're you're fine. I've touched base with him, so I don't Okay. If you look under the actual column, uh, the 2122 actual column under the building fund, it's the very last page of your packet, you will see a line that is called transfers from district, and you will see $2.5 million there. You will also see where the foundation gave us $40,000, $50,000, and so that was all of the income, income for the building fund. For years, we always had to budget for a planned transfer into a building fund. The legislature a few years ago, five years ago, said, nope, nope. You can no longer keep a bunch of cash on hand without a plan to use it. Because some districts would hoard money and hoard money and hoard money in their carryover balances. That's what it's called, a carryover balance, which is basically a savings account. It's your cash balance. Think about your checking account. Whatever's left over at the end of the month, that's your carryover into the next month. Our legislator said, you can no longer carry more than 20% of the value of your current revenues. And so at the end of the year, if 20% of all of the revenue that you receive is more is less than what your cash balance is, you have to move that into your building fund. You can't spend it on anything else. You must move it into your building fund, but you must also have projects that you plan to use to spend it on. You can't just, move, and you guys are like, that never showed up anywhere on my board report. You're right. It's not going to. I don't know what that number is until the last week of August. I don't finalize prior year until the last week of August because we're still getting reports from the state. We're still getting promises of getting money. And so it's, it's not something I can predict at the end of June. Um, so your carryover balance. Uh-oh, We need a drum roll. <laughs> we really setting this one up. It's stuck. <laughs> it's frozen. We asked too many questions. Yeah. And shut off. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Mm. Hit freeze. Yeah. Hit restart. You can verbalize okay. it. Um, so with the $2.5 million carryover last there year, there oh, okay. Yay. how is it calculated? The calculation is based on certain types of revenues the district receives from state and local sources. Once those figures are finalized in August, you can have a cash balance of up to 20% of those revenues. So if we have more cash on hand than the calculation says we can have, that's what gets moved into the building fund. I know there has been some concern on how we were going to pay for our office building that seemed to ha going to cost a lot more than what we had budgeted for. But we knew we were going to have some carryover that had to be moved. Um, again, we never know what that number is until it's all said and done. But for this budget, this budget here that I have presented you today, based on the revenues, our cash balance cannot be more than 8,657,118. This budget shows it to be less than that. I don't have to do anything. You said 8,000, it's 8 million. I'm sorry, 8 million. I'm tired. I'm tired. Um, yeah, I'm tired looking at these. And so anyway, uh, we would not have to do anything. But if it's more than that, 
that excess gets transferred over. Do you have any questions? Or you send it back to the state, right? No. But theoretically, yes, we could do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we, yeah. we could. That's what happens. That yeah. is, if you don't have a plan for it. If you have no we've plan, we've got years and back. years of <laughs> projects. <laughs> right. We are not going to run out of yeah. we list. <laughs> we've got a large well, well, long list. It's important, yeah, it's important to say that. that well, that another thing to point out. Have, right. Another thing to goals. Then, yeah. Then it just goes away. Is we have built so many things with carryover or planned transfers into the building fund. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of like a catch-22. We've never had to go back to the taxpayers and ask them for more millage. We have paid cash. We haven't had to take out a new bond. We haven't had to do, there are lots of things that we have not had to do, and yet we have great facilities, we have new buildings. Um, I'm very proud of that. Yes. So going back just on that point, our last millage increase was for the high school, and it was 2008 that we passed that. We built the high school in 2012. Since that millage increase, and that millage increase was specifically formulated to pay for the high school as it was being built. Um, but since that millage increase, not only did we do the high school, but we have remodeled this building. That was about an eight million, this was about an $8 million uh, remodel. We added four classrooms on the north side. We remod well, we built a new library at north side. We remodeled the office area at north side. We built a um, uh, yes. built yes. cast building at the high school. We built the stadium at the high school. We built the food, uh, the freezer storage area at maintenance, um, and we've expanded the bus garage parking lot. Those were all pretty major. We redid uh, the track too. Oh, and we redid the track. So those were all pretty major construction projects mm -hmm. that we have not had to go back to our taxpayers for. And most of that money has come through uh, money left over at the end of the year that we've been able to move over into the building fund and take care of those things. And so now we've got the administration building that we're gonna be able to do that with. And then the next goal would be baseball, softball, tennis out of that same pot or that same type of funding. Uh, so anyway, that's that's a testament to I think uh, uh, our district's ability to put a little bit back each year with some goals in mind. Do you guys have any other questions? No, ma'am. I'd like to ask that you all pass the 22-23 budget. I guess I can't make that motion, but I'm begging you to please, please pass this budget. Second. <laughs> there you go. Did I make a motion? Make? There. Okay. Second. No, we got a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Got you. Your budget. Thank you, Terry. Yes, thank you, Terry. Yeah. Good thank job. You, thank, you. thank you. Yes. Awesome. Yes. I get tongue tied. Motion yep. to adjourn. Second. <laughs> That's it. All right. Amen. All in favor? Aye. 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 Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>